9-11, exclamation point. September the 11th, 2001, forever changed air travel in America. We went from fly the friendly skies to the long security lines we experienced at every airport. This evening on The Rock Newman Show, a look at airport security with airport security expert, Dr. Stacy Tyler, author of a new book, The Inside Man. We're also joined by retired air traffic controller, Will Bailey. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University in Washington, D.C. I'm Rock Newman, and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. This evening, we look at airport security. How safe are we in the air or at the airport? We'll explore that with airport security expert and lecturer Dr. Stacy Tyler, author of a new book, the Inside Man. We're also joined by Will Bailey, a Howard University alum and former DC Metro Area Air Traffic Control Specialist. He did that for 20 years. Thank both of you for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you for having I'll me. Tell you what, Thank you. before I uh, start uh, with each of you, uh -huh. I'd like to do something to share with my audience. Um, I sent a text message about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I sent it to a lady. Her name was Miss Teresa Pryor. I said, greetings, Miss Pryor. Mm -hmm. I host the Rock Newman Show on PBS station WHUT in Washington, D.C. On Wednesday, November the 14th, we will host Dr. Stacy Tyler to discuss airline safety. We would like for you or your daughter, Sierra, to join us to share your thoughts about the tragic loss of your son, Aaron. I can be reached and I gave her my telephone number. Mm -hmm. She responded by saying, so sorry, mm -hmm. we are still mourning the loss of my son. So no, not at this time. Plus, we're still in lit litigation. I re responded and said, I understand condolences. Dr. Tyler, I yes. wanted to start there to really kind of jar our listening audience here today into paying attention to something that is critical. Mm -hmm. We are airing this show exactly one week prior to the busiest day of the travel um, year. Right. And Mrs. Pryor talked about not being able to come here to discuss the loss of her son who was killed at Correct. the Philadelphia airport. He was someone who was one of your former employees. That's correct. One, can you please tell us, as we discuss airline security, how it is that her son died, which obviously means there was a colossal failure of security. Absolutely. Um, Aaron Jenkins was my employee. Um, I was the general manager for GAT at the Philadelphia International Airport, and I had JetBlue Airlines underneath my, my leadership. Mm -hmm. And I hired Aaron Jenkins as a ramp employee. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I, I came to know Mr. Jenkins. Right. Well, now when it comes to myself as a leader, and my study in airport security, yeah. dealing with the miscommunication of TSA policies yeah. down to the frontline employees, yeah. preventing weapons, contraband, and prohibited items passing through security checkpoint and or access point. Uh -huh. So in this case with Aaron Jenkins, um, it's a complete failure because the weapon that was utilized, um, it was a knife. Yeah. It was deemed as a box cutter regardless, is yeah. still a prohibited item yeah. that 
penetrated the security access point by using the employee's CIDA badge and getting it passed through yeah. security. So there was some sort of conflict with he and another gentleman. Absolutely, The yes. other gentleman mm -hmm. used a weapon. Weapon. That right. should have been picked up by security that he should not have been able to have. Right. Well, let me clarify. Mm -hmm. As far as airline employees, yeah. we have a CIDA badge that we use to mm -hmm. gain access through the security access point. Okay. We don't have to go through security checkpoints okay. as passengers. Right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So we utilize our CIDA badges. Yeah. So with those badges, you can bring anything through. Mm -hmm unless there's random security checks that's conducted, right. okay, by uh -huh. TSA. As an employee. As an employee. Mm -hmm. So those checks are randomly done, uh -huh. okay? Um, let let me just ask you a mm -hmm. question. Those checks are randomly done. Do, would, you, would you advocate that they not be randomly done, that everybody that comes through mm -hmm. checks? What, what are you suggesting? Well, there's only four airports throughout the aviation system that are at 100% screening. Uh -huh. Now at 100% screening, that means that passengers and airline and airport employees right. are being screened right. at 100% screening. Because what, 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 what jumps out at me mm -hmm. is, is here's a gentleman mm -hmm. who lost his, his life, life right. due to a weapon. Correct. And whether or not that person with that weapon or someone with very bad intent, terrorist mm -hmm. or otherwise, Correct who is an employee, who is an employee, might be able to have access to a wider body Correct. of individuals. Mm -hmm. And if that person got through and killed someone, mm -hmm. this person with these bad intents could right. get through and kill a lot of people. Absolutely. Which means that we're extraordinarily unsafe. Correct. So in Aaron Jenkins' case, the altercation took place in a break room. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying that, you know, this person had every intent to kill. Sure. So, but something happened. But something happened. And, he had the weapon. and there was an altercation, not between the person who murdered him. Yeah. He had an altercation with somebody else. Yeah. This person just happened to jump in yeah. to break up the fight. Yeah. But what actually transpires that the Aaron threw the, the, um, the employee yeah. who murdered him. Yeah across the room, uh -huh. he gets up, reaches in his pocket, yeah. gets the weapon and then stab him in his upper thigh. So, and then there's an emergency so, response, you know, delay. Absolutely tragic. Correct. We're gonna discuss much more about this because you have written a book called The, called the Inside Man mm -hmm. that discusses uh, evaluating security communication failures at United States commercial airports. Folks, you're going to, many of you are gonna be traveling on on, on next Wednesday and through the, through the rest of the season, uh, the, the holiday season. And these are things that you're gonna need to be aware of. And we wanna examine much, much of that. This book, this book is frightening. <laughs> it is, uh, we find it so extraordinarily <laughs> well done in research and we oh, wanna talk you. a bunch about it. Absolutely. Uh, before we do, I wanna welcome again you, Will Bailey. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Will, I started off uh, today's broadcast by talking, <laughs> I said 9-11 exclamation point. And we talked about September 11 changing how flying in, a, in, in America and really throughout the world ha was impacted by that very tragic day. Um, it is my understanding that you as an air traffic controller were on duty that day, 9-11, uh, uh, September 11, 2011. Affirmative, 2001. Two, two, two thousand, <laughs> two, 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 2001. Two, two, 2001. 2001. Yes. Right. You were on duty. What's the first? What's the first you heard about the madness that was unfolding? Uh, when the supervisor basically uh, just shouted a command over the area, saying, "Okay, everybody, be careful! Somebody just hit the trade center." And the first glance, I'm like, "Trade center? What does that mean?" And I kind of assumed that maybe a small private pilot clipped the corner of it or something like that. So yeah. I never in my mind would I've even consider imagining that a uh, commercial airline would actually run into the Trade Center. The, I think I've told this story on air before, if not, I've certainly told it on Facebook. The plane that took off from Dulles that hit the Pentagon mm -hmm. is a plane that many of my family and friends thought I was on, because mm -hmm. the plane I always took on on Monday morning when I came back here, I had taken another flight, thank, 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 thank God. God. Mm -hmm. You 
Then, though, when people started to gather themselves, it is my understanding that you were directly responsible for helping pilots and jets to come out of the air and land. Would it have been in just this area? Well, yeah, there's three components of air traffic when you're talking about who actually talks to the actual airplanes. Mm -hmm. There's a tower jurisdiction, of course. When they leave the tower, they go to what's called approach control, where they actually sequence the jets going in and out of the airports. And then us, at that time, I was working at the Washington Root Center, which handles... Washington in Root Center? Affirmative. Uh -huh. Yeah, it handles all the airplanes. Uh, basically, you we're retired, the... You retired, right? Affirmative. Uh, yes. uh, affirmative. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we. But you didn't retire affirmative. <laughs> right. Oh, my apologies. No problem. Uh, no problem. Force of habit. Um, we basically keep the airplanes from, you know, keep them, keep them apart, keep them separated, keep them in sequence. So during rush hour, we're the ones who actually sequence them and actually get them running to the airports, nice and uh, nice and smoothly. So, with regards to what happened that day, um, yes. Uh, the approach control actually handles those airplanes. We were responsible for taking care of them once they leave approach control or when they're coming back to approach control. Okay, so mm -hmm. give me an example mm -hmm. of what, you're, what, what communication you're providing. What are you, what are you, are you once you take over approach control, mm -hmm. are, you, are, you, are you the voice that's talking to a pilot? Or is yeah. that Yes, sir. And tell me, tell me something that you remember from that time. Man, this is some fascinating <laughs> stuff to me. Well, the, funny thing, the funniest thing about that is I assumed that everything happened in 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but we were given different directives. After the first one hit the tower, we were given one directive. Then the second one hit the tower, we got another directive. Then I remember um, supervisor going and shouting, okay, everybody pay attention. We just lost one in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania airspace was adjacent to the airspace I was working. It's in another, this New York center, but it was right adjacent to where I was working. And so now I'm confused. And then they came back and yelled, all right, everybody pay attention. They just got the Pentagon. And I jumped out of my chair. What do you mean, got the Pentagon? That's yeah. right up the street. So it was, um, and it's not at all hazy, but in order to get into that conversation, it's going to be a long conversation because mm -hmm. so yeah. many things transpired right. within a few seconds. Yeah. Um, and we were given different directives. At one time, we were ordered to, um, you know, every, at that point, we had to make sure, of course, we keep the standard level of operation going with separation. So the pilots knew absolutely nothing was going on. Yeah. And uh, we were just ordered to move airplanes around and then eventually get every, every airplane out of the sky and put them on the ground immediately. Yeah. So basically grounding every flight. Yeah. And um, so it was a contentious time that literally took about a little bit over two hours, I believe, because I think this, in, this happened shortly after 9 a.m. And yeah. by the time I got to the cafeteria on break, when every airplane was on the ground, it was after 11. Yeah. And um, that was a day that um, we could talk about that for days. So I'm, so, so I'm on a plane. I'm on a, I'm on a plane. Mm -hmm. yes. Instead of taking the plane that I normally take that flew into the yeah. Pentagon, mm -hmm. I took a plane from, uh, from a national airport. It was National Airline that I didn't know exist, existed until mm -hmm. that weekend. So my plane took off at like 8.30. Mm -hmm. The flight hit the Pentagon that everyone thought I was yeah. on at whatever that was, 8.42. So we didn't know anything until about an hour or so into the flight. The plane started to make several banks and we were like, what's going on? The pilot came on and said, there's some sort of air, this, this I remember, there's an air traffic hold and no one knew what really that meant. Mm -hmm. And finally, the plane that I was on, which was bound uh, nonstop to Las Vegas, was grounded in St. Louis, Missouri. And by the time we were starting to hit the ground, some people with their cell phones, my cell phone had died, uh, people with cell phones uh, started saying that the World Trade Center had been hit. And the lady I was sitting next to, I just remember her saying, this is lunacy, this is lunacy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tyler, I come back to you mm -hmm. Uh, in your book here, you um, articulate and illuminate mm -hmm. that the TSA yes. was that Transportation, Transportation Security, Security Administration, Administration yes. was formed mm -hmm. on the heels of 9/11. Of 9/11. Correct. And can you walk us through mm -hmm. what Transportation Security Administration is supposed to do? <laughs> And how it all worked. What? No, no, no. Before we go there, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were you on duty on 9/11? I just landed back. I'm from Pittsburgh, uh -huh. and I just landed back from um, 
Jackson, Mississippi. I was a general manager at the time for TWA okay. in Jackson, Mississippi, and I just arrived er early in the morning, and um, but I did not get impacted because I was home. Uh huh. So it didn't impact okay, me so you, okay, so you personally, actually, yeah. but it impacted my family. Yeah. My mother was working in the airline industry at the time. Yeah. Um, my younger sister, so job losses. Mm -hmm. My station closed. Uh -huh. You know, so the impact of 9/11 it just ran far, rapid far for yeah. the um, for the aviation industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so out of this uh, out of this tragedy, which 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 people said, you know. There was a failure mm -hmm. to imagine that a human being would get in a plane and sacrifice his life and flying right. to the World Trade Center. That, that hey, you know, the, the defense for not being able to block that was that no one could even imagine right. that that happened. But it did. Right. And out of it, the Transportation Security Administration was formed. Right. And your description, explanation of what their role and responsibility is. Can you please share that? Yes, well, the before the Transportation Security Administration, okay. the Federal Administration, Aviation Administration was in charge of the passenger screening um, and also the baggage screening along with cargo. So okay. the FAA had control over what the TSA had taken over, mm -hmm, okay. Okay? okay? So the passenger and baggage screening became federalized. Okay. Okay, meaning okay. that the government is in control of mm -hmm. the passengers and baggage screening. Mm -hmm. So the whole gamut for the TSA, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. is to screen those passengers, sure. bags, cargo. Right. Not only that, you know, there's customs, there's mm -hmm. borders, mm -hmm. you know, there's a whole gamut when it comes to the Transportation Security Administration. You know, and, and, and you point out something in, in some discussions that I've had with you, it's just, you know, maybe I should have known it. Mm -hmm maybe most people should, but probably most people don't, mm -hmm. that as a result of the formation of this mm -hmm. uh, TSA, uh, uh, Transportation Security Administration, right. that cost, yes. it cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, every time the passenger flies, the passenger to some extent is paying, right. underwriting right. the cost of the security that the Transportation Security Administration is supposed to provide. Mm -hmm. Right. So the passenger mm -hmm. has a right mm -hmm. as a paying customer right. and paying for this service mm -hmm. to walk to an airport and to feel very confident. That they're going to be safe and secure. And are they? That's a good question. Are they? Um, I can say from my research that there has been a lot of infractions that have been occurring since the um, implementation of the TSA um, into the aviation, uh, aviation system. Mm -hmm. um, there was a video that came out last year at this time that there's a 95% failed rate when it comes for, um, for the TSA or the TSO officers to detect. And TSO is? The Transportation Security Officers, Officer. okay. Mm -hmm. okay, and it's a 95% felt rate when it comes to um, capturing those prohibited items, weapons, oh. and contraband, and it's a congressional hearing. I lived in Las Vegas <laughs> for 13 years. Yes. When I hear 95% felt fail rate, rate. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to bet that I would get on a plane right. and be safe these right. days. I mean, and now, obviously, so many people do, and this is not mm -hmm. to at all be, you know, unduly alarming the public, but whatever the truth is and what facts are is what we try to bring out That's here right. at, the, at, at the Rock Newman Show. 95% mm -hmm. 95% failed rate. So that's not including my research because that is just only the passenger screening process. My research deals with the miscommunication of TSA policies down to the frontline employees where we are bringing those weapons, contraband, and prohibited items through. So that means that those cider badges that are around our necks on our lanyard, yeah. that's the gateway of the world. So whenever we as airline employees receive those cider badges, we are required to take um, training to two different courses, yeah. airport security and drive. And 
what I can say to you, I have 22 years in the airline industry. Mm -hmm. I have developed stations from the ground floor for five different carriers. I have been throughout the entire aviation system, whether your hub operation, whether your field location. Yeah. My mother retired from the airline industry, as I mentioned you, before. You got airports so, and airlines in your DNA. It, exactly. Okay. So what I can tell you is that it is the same information that is minimum training, that there's only four requirements that the airline and airport employees are, are instructed to follow when we have the training to receive the CIDA badge at the beginning of our employment. Is it easy to articulate what those four are? I mean, just kind of <laughs> bullet point. Yes. Okay. The, um, the four, um, wear your badge so it's visible mm -hmm. on the outermost garment, mm -hmm. above your waist, mm -hmm. no piggybacking, secure all doors. Mm -hmm. So those are the protocols, those are instructions that yeah. are given yeah. so that we can keep the, um, the, if the airport safe. Okay. Yes. Will Bailey, as an air traffic control person, you're hired by whom? Federal Aviation Administration, mm -hmm. FAA. That was the, so you were originally hired by the mm -hmm. F FAA. F F FAA. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, a, um, we have a little clip here about air traffic. Let's take a look. Airport ops. This is one the approach control. We yes, have sir. a 757, 20 miles northwest, not talking to anyone, headed toward the airport with a suspected bomb on board. We are evacuating the control tower and the approach control. Roger that, sir. FR. Roger. It is generally articulated that air traffic controllers have some of the most stressful jobs that anyone in the world has. Did you feel that way while you were doing your job? Well, stress is relative. Uh, the fact is, we do a job that anybody can do, but most people won't do it because, uh, I mean, you know, it's, you have thousands of people's lives in your hands at any given time in the day. Um, and just to go back to the first part about the Pentagon, yeah, I knew two people who actually died in the Pentagon. One was actually on the plane, uh, the parent of a son who I was coaching youth football in Loudoun Lo Lo County, and uh, Howard Grad. He was um, our com uh, commander uh, when I was in ROTC at Howard, and he was actually working in the Pentagon at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but with reference to this part of it, the stress is relative. Once you train, um, you know, of course, certain endorphins, are going, certain things are going to happen when things get elevated. But with regards to the safety component, 9-11, um, there's a huge system of checks and balances within our agency where we actually do our work. So in order for something to happen, like she was talking about protocols, and several things have to happen before we end up screwing up and allowing a, a commercial airline to actually run into the tower. So um, with relative to the first time I heard them say, one airplane hit the Trade Center. I, I didn't even blink real hard because I knew it was something simple. There's no way in the world that something yeah. you know that complicated could possibly happen. So, yeah. yes, it's um, it's always a stressful situation. However, um, you know, you once you're trained, you get comfortable, and you're not necessarily um, reacting to anything anymore. You're responding to each situation based on your training. Yeah, and just uh, just for our viewing our audience, that clip was a flight. Of, of Flight 93 that ult ultimately crashed on 9-11. Um, on mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I wanted to do, and we just didn't have permission for it, was to um, play the video, the mm -hmm. audio, from <clears throat> an event that took place out on the West Coast in Seattle this August, not 17 years ago, like 9-11, right. just this August, right. where a airline employee, employee, ground service employee, ground service employee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. takes a plane. Yeah, mm -hmm. he, he takes the plane. He steals the plane and he gets up in the air. He takes off. Right. He is talking to the uh, to the air traffic tower mm -hmm. saying, I guess I'm just a guy with a screw screw loose. And he asked, can we do black fips? Well, I'll do a belly roll. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you hear all of this video, mm -hmm. audio, and I wanted my audience to hear it, but I'm sharing it with <laughs> you now. Right. So can, can you, from your perspective yes. on the ground, yes. 
tell us sort of the nuts and bolts of one, how that happened and what could have been done to, what should have been done to prevent that. Right. And then I want to talk to you about once he's in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, Mr. Russell, that's his, that's his name. Okay. Um, he was a uh, ground service agent uh, for Alaska Airlines um, Horizon. And um, the plane was actually scheduled for line maintenance, okay? So oh, for line maintenance? Maintenance. Mm -hmm. So that means that the plane was positioned probably in a remote location. Okay. So when any plane is left unattended, that okay. means that it's not in service for any revenue flight. Yeah. Um, the agent literally did a uh, tow bar and tug procedure. Okay. That means that when he approached the plane, he approached the plane which was left unattended, uh -huh. um, which is secured. Yeah. The plane is secured, meaning uh -huh. that the panels, the doors are locked. Okay. Okay. He got into the tug, the tow bar, at attached it to the, the, uh, the plane, right. attached the tug to the tow bar, uh -huh. repositioned it 180 degrees uh -huh. and facing towards the runway. Right. Okay. He removed yeah. the equipment uh -huh. and access the, the, the so, doors. So, you know, in this little brain I have here, I'm thinking, you know, if, some, you, you, if somebody steals your car, if somebody looks in your car and you sees the see keys, it. mm -hmm. it's like, oh, wow, they right. got the keys in there, so it can't be locked. I'm going to go in I'm, and I'm going to steal your car. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, not to trivialize this, but did a pilot like, somebody, some, leave the key in, no, the, in the plane? Because, no. I mean, because <laughs> no. I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out it's how, supposed to be secure. Right. How to do get there? How right. did he get there and well, then take they, off? Huh? If right. you think about it, there have to be certain levels of security. And right. even with employees, the first mm -hmm. thing happens is background checks. Mm -hmm. uh, background checks, right. evaluations to see if you're mentally stable. But then after that, they base your job title, um, the control, your access based on your job title. Yeah. So if he actually had access to the airplane like that, obviously he had some authority to actually be in that area. And if you think about it, with but, every single aspect of society, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. ours, you know, they get to a certain point, um, basically we're on our own. Now, they, they're still over us. There's always a supervisor in the area. There's mm -hmm. always um, command center always mm -hmm. looking at. So if, mm -hmm. if I have an airplane going towards Newark and he veers off course, it's not just me, or this controller next to me, the controller in the next place, um, metering, uh, approaching, everybody's actually looking at that same airplane every right. single second. So even if, I screw up. A lot of other people have to screw up too mm -hmm. and ignore the situation in mm -hmm. order for something bad to happen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are these yeah. small windows of opportunity yeah, where I, something and, like and this can know, happen. And, and I would, because because <laughs> I couldn't put this down. Right. I right. want to come to you on this right. because what you're saying is, it's almost like the standard operating procedure right. for the three different agencies: TSA, the airline, and, 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 and airport. Right that there is a sense of territorialism right. amongst each. Right. There is too much. There's too much. <laughs> too much territorialism right. Right. and too little proper communication. Right. And your book screams loudly right. about the need for there to be much, not just communication, but much better communication right. between the three agencies. Absolutely. My book definitely stems on the communication that is lacking within the three entities, mm -hmm. okay? And my theoretical construct for the book is the WIC 1979 Organizational Information Theory. Okay. That means that it's the way that the information uh, is transferred down to the frontline employees within the three entities, okay? WIC's 1979 Organizational Information Theory Focused on, focused on the process, the process of communication, mm -hmm. the process of getting the information down to the frontline employees mm -hmm. within the three entities, mm -hmm. um, which are the lack of information mm -hmm. or lack of uncertainty, mm -hmm. which that means that if the information is passed down properly, right. then there won't be no uncertainty. Mm -hmm. The 95% failed mm -hmm. the um, the the the, um, the Horizon Airline yeah. who yeah. stole the plane right. the the information mm -hmm. you know that needs to come down to mm -hmm. the frontline employee. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is interdependence 
promotes transparency, mm -hmm. meaning that there are 20 units within the layers of security for TSA, yeah. starting with intelligence, ending with the passengers. Mm -hmm. So there are 20 units within TSA structure mm -hmm. that if there's a policy change, it has trickled all the way down mm -hmm. to the passengers. And you, you, you position in your book here mm -hmm. that that is a failure, a failure of communicating from the, the top, top to, to the bottom. To make sure that the tra traveling public is safe. Mm -hmm. So the as traveling the air public, make sure the pro traveling public who is safe, who is paying a tax to be safe. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so within that budget, the $7.9 billion budget right. that was just approved at the right. beginning of the year, mm -hmm. um, there's a security tax on every segment, every segment of a ticket. Uh -huh. So that means that it's up to $6.60 okay. times two uh -huh. if you're returning back. Sure. So that is the tax, that's the cost mm -hmm. for the traveling public to pay mm -hmm. the government mm -hmm. so we can get our money back. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes, I do. Okay, so so within, <laughs> within the the transparency of those policies being transferred down to the mm -hmm. frontline employees uh -huh. so that we can make sure that we are doing our jobs properly right. so that the traveling public would be safe. Right. And policies such as the 311. What's that mean? Uh, 311 is 3.5 3.4 ounces. Oh, okay. That, yeah, stuff one, you can t carry on. Right, uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. uh, because that policy came about was August 10th, 2006 terrorist attack, Great Britain terrorist attack mm -hmm. that occurred um, where the terrorist plot was in a form of liquid. So now that because of that, mm -hmm because TSA policies are ever evolving. Right. W whatever happens out here in society, we have to accommodate. We have to do, you know, have a policy to make sure that the traveling public is safe. So hence, the 311 policy came about. Mm -hmm. So the plot actually unfoiled August 9th, 2006. Mm -hmm. By August 10th, 2006, I am literally at work and the, the line is out the door because now TSA is confiscating all liquids in jails, and as an operations manager, yeah. it's like, where are all the passengers? They're stuck at the security checkpoint because that information wasn't communicated. Properly communicated that, out to the, those passengers, to, to the, you. To the right. employee group, yeah. so that we can make sure that we can accommodate those passengers so yeah. here, yeah. we have performance, yeah. so we had to leave the passengers behind, the bags, the passengers, the tickets, the reaccommodation, because of something just happened immediately. Yeah. You know, so that's, uh, you know, that's some kind of on a, that's a real good example mm -hmm. of what happens with a failure to communicate, Correct. you know, on, 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 a, on a micro level. Right. So you've got, so you have people who paid for tickets, mm -hmm. who are trying to go see loved ones right. and, all the rest right. and they can't go because of this internal screw up <laughs> yes right not a good thing okay <laughs> right. now uh, now over here mm -hmm. on page 52 in mm -hmm. your book mm -hmm. we talk about a nine-year-old boy with a history of stealing cars and running away sneaked onto a plane right. bound for texas mm -hmm. <laughs> he's he snuck on a plane because he like this little nine-year-old boy right Found a board, found the Southwest Airlines boarding pass. Right. Right. Okay. Right. There are there are other examples. An Iraqi immigrant with a suspicious device stuffed into a body cavity mm -hmm. was detained at Los Angeles International Airport. He was going to Philadelphia. Uh, you know, when we were speaking, you mentioned. Drug smuggling, yes, to a large on a large scale, correct. That involved airline employees, airport yes. security people. Yes, can yes. you t talk to us about? Okay, that? so the infractions that are occurring. This is what I'm referring to with my research. Yeah. Um, as far as this policy being miscommunicated down to the frontline employees, right. preventing those items passing through security checkpoints and or access points. Right. So now you're having um, the airline and airport employees misusing 
um, those CIDA badges that are given. Mm -hmm. So now, within the aviation industry, we have incidences, infractions that have been occurring. Yeah. Um, I can I can take you 2013. We had a a drug smuggling ring out of Philadelphia, a yeah. cocaine drug smuggling ring, um, where this employee smuggled 150. You were the general manager of the station, but you weren't the general manager of that <laughs> drug smuggling ring. No, and this is in 13. <laughs> <laughs> I was there, but I was not the general manager at okay. the time. I was okay. with U.S. Airways. Right. Um, in fact, I was with U.S. Airways okay. at the time. Okay. And. Um, what happened is that this employee smuggled 153 pounds of cocaine for a Dominican Republic uh, drug smuggling ring. We have in 2014, Ooh. we have 2014 a gentleman by the name of Eugene Harvey, a Delta airline employee, yeah. who smuggled 156 firearms through the security access point. And so let's stop by. right there. Let's <laughs> stop right there. Because I thought, I thought when we talked on the phone yes. that I heard you say that. Yes. So an airline employee yes. smuggled on to... 20, over 20 aircrafts. 156... Firearms. Firearms. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so paying mm -hmm. public that you're paying that tax to be safe. Yes, yes. it's 153. It's 153. 153. Five, okay. Five, five, okay. Three, give or take. Three less. Give or take three. <laughs> give or take three Uzis. Right. right. Um, we are smiling and we are laughing, but man, this ain't no joke. I know, right? Well, I want to. I want to come back to you again. I find it an extraordinarily interesting career that you've had after you graduated from the Mecca Howard University. <laughs> um, can you please share with us, what was the most, other than 9-11, share with us some of your most challenging times. Uh, uh, something either that was most frightening, that you are most pleased about your participation, I know you're not a guy to want to ever want to brag about yourself, but <laughs> let it rip. Well, that's um, that's a tough one because any given day you can actually have an incident or two or three or four or five that would basically what I say sting you. It, you know, you'd um, every few weeks or so you'd have something happen that literally, um, you know, when you go take a break, you really need to take a break. <laughs> and um, I remember um, once. Uh, the things that affect air traffic basically are uh, during rush hour, bad weather, when the airport's holding because then we got a lot of airports mm -hmm. in the sky mm -hmm. and things. So as long hold as on, hold on, see you guys mm -hmm. are you guys are veterans. <laughs> you know, me sorry, and my me and my there. audience here we haven't worked in the airline. So rush hour, rush, rush yeah. hour. Um, just uh, imagine it. When this traffic way. Air, is heavy in the air, just right. imagine it this way. Air traffic for us. Basically, if you took a map of this entire area and dictated, you know, notated all of the streets, the highways, the intersections, um, and you put that in the sky. Basically, mm -hmm. there are airways in the sky. Mm -hmm. So just like when you're on 95 and you connect to the 495 or 210, and during rush hour, you got a lot of traffic merging into the same places because uh -huh. everybody leaves at the same time and gets back at the same time. That's okay. the same thing in air travel. Okay. And so during rush hour, everything is fine. Let's go back to the street. on, on uh, on the highway, everything is fine until what? Uh, weather gets bad, gets slippery, somebody has a car accident. Mm -hmm. um, or, and when do accidents happen? When people are not paying attention on their cell phone and some mm -hmm. other things like that. The air is basically the same way as far as we're concerned. You know, things get a little bit complicated when the weather gets bad because certain airports get shut down and now we don't divert those aircraft right away. Mm -hmm. We follow, um, you know, a normal protocol and put those airports mm -hmm. in holding, of course, after we get the um, after we get the command to do so. Mm -hmm. And so, so basically when we slow airplanes down, slow as feasible speed, uh, because of course they have to keep going fast or else mm -hmm. they fall out of the sky, um, then we have to do something to them until you make room on the, on the ground at the right. airport so we can get them. So right. we put them in holding patterns. And um, uh, I remember the most specific one I've ever had since we've gotten started with this was, um, it was about, uh, it was halfway through my career. It was probably early 2000s. This was after 9-11, it was early 2000s where we were actually, um, it was busy, very busy. Every airport in the Northeast Corridor was closing. Teterboro, uh, LaGuardia, mm -hmm. Atlantic mm -hmm. City, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Newark, 
Kennedy, mm -hmm. every airport, and we handle all that traffic going up there. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine the amount of airplanes that's in the sky. Did you time. say they were mm -hmm. closed? All of them? All of them. All of them are closed. Sure. Of them are yeah, oh, God. Okay. So oh, now God. we're holding, and basically they're taking one out at a time as they can get some room at the airport. Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, airports, um, you know, have, you know, set seven airplanes holding here from, say, 25,000 to 33,000 30, feet mm -hmm. here and here. So these holding patterns with no room in the middle. Right. And um, then the controller before me calls and said, hey, you know, we got one coming to you, um, uh, Nordo, which means no radio contact. Nobody's talking to him. Mm -hmm. So if the airport, if the airplane is not talking to us, his last command, he's just going to follow it. Yeah. So they found his, air, his flight and they knew where he was going. So I had to move airplanes from out of a holding pattern. So one guy wasn't responding fast enough. And literally, it's, um, you know, the airplanes tell each other what to do. Okay. So just imagine if one thing goes wrong, an airplane tells this airplane to climb, this airplane to climb, this mm -hmm. one, this one to turn, and yeah. then it's almost a chaotic situation if you allow it to be. It's an extremely stressful situation, but because of the training, we're completely in control of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but I'm telling you, I can literally look down and I could see my shirt popping off my chest because my heart's beating so fast. Yeah. Right. But then when we reviewed the tape afterwards, my voice didn't change. I didn't move in my seat. Mm -hmm. Everything was completely normal. So. The type of stress that we deal with, we, we, we can't, we're trained to basically respond to every situation. Of course, most, I, I tell this to people all the time, most jobs or most careers, mm -hmm. you can kind of be familiar with a certain subject and get by with it. Ours, yeah. Yeah. you have to know the inf information verbally, uh, you have to know the information specifically, you have, verbatim. And at any given moment, you have to be able to regurgitate it appropriately to that situation. Mm -hmm. So that level of confidence actually reduces the stress some. Yeah. However, the toll it takes on your body after a certain amount yeah. of time, oh, it mm -hmm. beats you up badly. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Tyler, mm -hmm. you know, part of what <clears throat> your book explains, mm -hmm. I watched a video mm -hmm. that you did at the Philadelphia I Airport. Yes where you had Philadelphia uh, employees, employees. Mm -hmm. and they were, when I heard, when I constantly heard a theme that was coming out of your presentation, mm -hmm. and then when you asked questions, you got the employees to sort of open up probably like they rarely ever do. Right. And they talked, uh, uh, so they're the inside men and women. <laughs> Absolutely. And they talk about their concerns. Right. That, and their concerns, the theme mm -hmm. was laxity, Lax. mm -hmm. was inconsistency, inconsistent Correct. communication, Correct. failure to communicate. Right. And at the, what I, the, the reason I wanted to make sure that we did this show mm -hmm. was to highlight what you've done in all of your research in producing this book. Yes. Now, part of what you are attempting to do, if I understand it correctly, is you're trying to appeal to the TSA, mm -hmm. airports, right. airlines, Correct. to alert them to your findings, Correct. to have each of them to improve their systems. Mm -hmm. You have developed curriculums Correct. that would help them do that. Right. And when you communicate to them, what kind of response are you getting? That's excellent, wrong. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, absolutely, that's that's the basis. And I have developed uh, a ten-course homeland security curriculum, including two online courses mm -hmm. to help to help and to improve the airport security um, process for new hires and also the training for recurrent employees within the aviation system. Mm -hmm. So you gotta understand that whenever you're looking at the dynamics at, the, um, at any airport, there's only three legacy carriers left, mm -hmm. United, American, and Delta. Okay. Now they have strict protocols, strict training, okay. recurrent training. Right. Um, I will throw Southwest Airlines in that, that mix also because they have been in existence for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, but now you have a lot of contractors that are evolving who are doing the same exact job as the legacy carriers, the airlines. Okay. So it's seamless, so you couldn't even tell who is a contractor and who is an airline uh -huh. legacy. 
and, employee. And, and those contractors are doing what kind of work for the airline? Same. Or in, uh -huh. Ticket counter, uh -huh. gate, ramp. Uh -huh. Same thing. Uh -huh. You will so, never, you so, will never so, know the difference. So, so independent contractor. Correct. Hired by the agency. Hired by a contracting company. Okay. Hired by the airline mm -hmm. to do the the job. Okay. It's a contract. Okay, and so then. So Princess, then it's Princess critical. Now, Airlines, so now you have JetBlue another Airlines. area that is so critical mm -hmm. in there being communication. Correct. To, to have the to have the policies I trained properly. Yeah. To have the information to to have the information, the TSA policies to be trained effectively down to the frontline employees. Yeah. So with those online classes, mm -hmm. there's an online framework. Mm -hmm. I am also a professor. Uh -huh. at Emory Riddle Aeronautical University. Okay. So I teach, <laughs> I teach online courses uh -huh. worldwide. So I have students all over the world. Okay. So this framework would be, you know, you know common nature for myself. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to implement training within each, not just the major, I'm talking about each airport so that there will be no lax protocols mm -hmm. and no inconsistency because when it comes to the internal threat, yes. this is what we're talking about. This yeah. is deemed as the internal threat. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that those policies are trained properly mm -hmm. because when it comes to the uh, security aspect, there, each airline, we have a corporate security department, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? a corporate security department or a regulatory compliance department right. where that information that comes from Department of Homeland Security or TSA, any kind of government agency, they get this information. Mm -hmm. That information is, in, is then transferred or sent to the leadership. Right. Okay? So where and when that information coming from leadership mm -hmm. all the way down to the frontline employees. Mm -hmm. Where's the gap? How yeah. do we fill that gap yeah. with security? Yeah. Changes in policy right. from TSA. Right. So how do in we your, know? In your years of research and writing this book Correct. and, and getting, doing your thesis right. and getting your PhD, right. in addition to that, it's, it, you know, it, I tried to find somebody else like you. There isn't. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, that's an interesting comment. Now, I didn't know you were going to make that, but I tried yeah. to find somebody else like you mm -hmm. who has done this kind of research, mm -hmm. who also has grown up in the industry so mm -hmm. that you're not just doing research and interviewing airline employees, airline personnel, TSA, and the rest. You've lived that life. I have real life experiences. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so unapologetically here at the Rock Newman Show, mm -hmm. we don't mind being change agents. Let there you go. You. This is social and, change. And <laughs> as a, and, 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 you know, as a change right. agent to, if, we, if we've got our hands around this the way I think the staff and I have, yes. is that there's, a, there, there's an incredible need for improvement Absolutely. throughout each of these uh, TSA airline and, and airport. Correct. And again, you've gotten quite a bit of resistance right. to, for them to one, acknowledge the problem. Correct. And two, to fix the problem. Right. So I have, um, I've done my due diligence mm -hmm. as far as um, meeting with um, certain politicians um, along the way. I've met with uh, CEOs of airports security team okay. not the, the CEO itself because mm -hmm. they will give transfer that information send that information to their security personnel okay. who's in charge of security mm -hmm. so whenever I am invited to speak yeah. with the individual and this information comes out it's like wait how okay it's not received it's a because it's a, it's, resistance. it's a resistance because it sh it will shed light on their back their job their job function mm -hmm. so i shed light the on the things that they the, the, the things that light on the, that, the that, that, they're, that they're not properly doing correct so what they're doing is they're protecting their flank mm -hmm. at the risk of, of the, the public there you go. The passenger there you being go. unprotected there you go absolutely 
So. Will Bailey, so I'll come, let me come back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will Bailey, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you have a very unique, you retired a few years mm -hmm. ago, you have a very unique operation where you, uh, part of what you're doing is you're doing, you're into the, very much into the world of fitness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a place out in Fort Washington, Maryland, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I think is going to be, um, that I think is going to be a magnet for for people who are interested in fitness and, and health. But in, as it relates to what we're talking about today, you initiated a few years ago STEM program, mm -hmm. and you have things that you are teaching kids about aviation. So at this time where we are exposing some of the failures, and hopefully those who are involved in not protecting the failures will understand the value of what Dr. Tyler is trying to bring. Mm -hmm. But you're at, now you're telling young kids, what are you teaching young kids about this world? Uh, that's a very broad question that would take a long <laughs> about time. About this but, world of aviation. But the specific one is this. It's, um, we are, uh, I'm based on my own experience. When I started with air traffic, I knew nothing about airplanes. Matter of fact, I think I've only been on an airplane once when I went to grad school for air traffic in 93. Um, and I knew nothing about air traffic, knew nothing about aviation, had the opportunity, aced the FA exam, and I got the opportunity to go to Minnesota to grad school. Uh, when we first got there, mm -hmm. everything looked Greek. Um, mm -hmm. Literally, mm -hmm. they put this huge map in front of you and say you have to be able to draw this from scratch in a week or else, you know, if you don't get a 90%, you go home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the stress behind that alone, you know, and I'm looking at the map and, you know, once we figured out a way to learn the map, um, course once we got down to the components of air traffic it's basically three-dimensional thinking that's why when I was explaining something earlier I started doing this and I put my hands down because I you know I can't really picture that on the screen but it's a different level of thinking in order to be able to be a successful air traffic controller you have mm -hmm. to be able to um, not just analyze situation not just take different bits of information and put them in and apply them it's a lot of things that go into that, that requires look uh, you have to have some level of arrogance to do my job. That's it's right. simple as that. Um, right. And you know, I used to say That's confidence right. because mm -hmm. everybody says confidence, but no, it, mm -hmm. you have to be arrogant to do That's this right. job. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but the your you you become ses successful because of your ability to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with reference to my STEM program, you know, I initially just wanted to do an air traffic school where because I would start the kids off the same way and then it would but it evolved into STEM because now we do robotics, Lego engineering, computer Excellent. programming, um, we're building a space shuttle at my place in Fort Washington. Um, rather than just exposing kids to this component, we actually challenged them. Uh, the same way we did when we got started, you put something in front of them that makes, like there's no way in the world I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. And then you either tell them you do it or you go home, you're out of the program. Mm. That we won't be that graphic, but mm. of course, a week later or two weeks later, they'll realize what they're doing and then we'll remind them, hey, yeah. remember two weeks ago when you mm -hmm. thought this was, you yeah. couldn't do it? Mm -hmm. And eventually that level of training and okay. that level of confidence, once they start learning something they didn't know what they could do before. For our it, um, viewing audience, how mm -hmm. can they get in touch with you for this um, fascinating program for kids? Willpower247.com. Willpower247.com. Affirmative. Dr. Yeah. Taylor, I want to come back to you. I cannot mm -hmm. believe we only have like a couple of minutes left mm -hmm. here. But I want to ask you, after all these years in the business mm -hmm. and this kind of research that you've done, you now have painted a picture today that um, we should be concerned if not alone. What, what is your goal? What is your dream that would happen out of all this work that you've done that the airlines, the TSA, the airports would do what? My goal is to ensure that the traveling public is safe okay. by ensuring that every every airline and airport employee is trained properly mm -hmm. on the TSA policies. Implementing my training in every airport throughout the country, mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. platform, and also classroom format. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and obviously that's an up that's been an uphill battle. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, as you explain, there is a resistance to exposing mm -hmm. what the problems are. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there any strategy? We only have a we only have a minute and thirty seconds. Okay. Um, it, what can the what is it anything the flying public can do mm -hmm. to help put pressure on those <laughs> to make them safe? Yes. Well, there's a person that I would love for you guys to contact, mm -hmm. uh, Congresswoman Bonnie. 
Watson Coleman. Okay. That's out of the 12th Congressional District in New Jersey. Uh -huh. And I have her contact number. Okay. Um, do you want me to say? The police okay. do. Please do. <laughs> We're trying to make people safe. <laughs> and it's in the D.C. office, area code 202 223 5801. And that is the political environment, but also the largest airline, excuse me, airport association is called Triple AE. That is the American Airline Executive for okay. the airports. Okay. okay, so it's Triple AE. And the two individuals' names that I would love to give out is, yep, Pat, give out. is Pat Racker mm -hmm. and Tico Coleman. Okay. And they could be reached at area code 703 797 2552 to get your voices heard to make sure that this kind of training, it is prevalent within the aviation industry to ensure that the airline employees are trained properly so there could be some cohesiveness for the traveling public. Thank you so very much for both of you being here for today. Mm -hmm. Folks, thank you for joining us this evening. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org. Good night, be safe, and may God bless you. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.